Hello, what's up, and welcome to the Engineered Life Vlog, where we talk what engineering is all about. I'm away to and from work. Today, I'm very excited to announce that I'm going to be getting a new project, and that is I'm going to be building a DIY electric longboard. Finally, after all these years, I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Um, see my longboard. I've had my longboard for about six years now, and uh, since the beginning of college, I want to I wanted to electrify it, but I uh, never really got around to it. Never really had the time. And you know what? I had the spark today at work, and I said, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and do it, and I'm going to get it done. So uh, stick around for this little mini vlog series of me building a DIY electric skateboard. Let's jump right into the computer work and get some parts over. All right, guys. I am back home, ready to order some components. But wait, there's an issue. How will I know what parts to get? How big should the motor be? What kind of gear should I get? Should I use a pulley system, a chain system? How am I going to put this together? Hmm, let me check on my engineering notes. Hmm. Mm hmm. All right, so it is time for a little engineering. And what we want to do is we want to start off with a problem that we want to solve. That's how all engineers begin to make something. They must establish a problem. Well, what is the problem in this case? In this case, the problem is I'm lazy and I want to go up a hill without pushing. So I'm going to need some electric motors to do it. So. Now that we have a problem, let's fully define it. So we want to go up this hill upwards, okay? So we must think, how are we going to go up this hill? Well, we know that in order to go up this hill, we need to have a force that is greater than the forces pushing us back down the hill okay so what are these forces that will be pushing us down the hill well what keeps us grounded and on earth we have this thing called gravity so that is force number one and gravity pushes us straight down to the ground so let's go ahead and draw this in we have gravity pulling us back down to the earth so force of gravity okay and we have a another force which is called friction and friction always opposes the direction that we're trying to go in so if we're trying to go in this direction F required well, friction is going to try and bring us backwards. So this is the force of friction. Okay, so now that we have this labeled out, um, we need to make sure that our force required going upwards that we're doing this analysis all in the same plane. Well, this force of gravity that's bringing us back down well, that isn't, you know, going in the direction that is going opposite of the force required or all the way. So we need to find that component of gravity that's bringing us back down to ground. And this is how we do it. So the force of gravity here. Um, and then we break it into two components. One component that's running perpendicular to the surface and one component that's running parallel to that surface. So this is going to be our X component and this is going to be our Y component of our force of gravity. Okay, so now due to trigonometry um, and geometry, we know that this angle right here is going to be the same as this angle right here. So let's go ahead and redraw this triangle so we can find the force of gravity that is in the x direction, which is what we want. So redrawing this triangle, 
We have our theta. We have our right angle. And we have, uh, see, if we just rotate this triangle, we have Fy right here and Fx right here and the force of gravity right here. So using SOHCAHTOA, which is a, a way of geometry of telling us what um, size and angle that we care about, well, we care about finding Fx and we know our gravity and we know this angle. Therefore, we are going to select, well, opposite of the angle is fx and our hypotenuse is gravity. So we are going to select our sine. Okay, so let's go ahead and write out the equation for fx. We can say that sine of an angle is going to equal to our opposite over our hypotenuse, right? So solving for x of x or fx, we get f gravity equals Uh, our sine, oh, I'm sorry, did that wrong. F gravity times sine of theta. So that's what Fx is going to equal to. So now we have everything in the same plane. What we can do is create an equation and set all of the forces in this plane, they um, must equal each other if they're going to be in a static position. So we can say the sum of our forces, set that equal to zero. Therefore, we can say we have the force of friction plus the force uh, due to gravity in the x direction, right? Those are all going the same direction. Minus F required is going to equal zero. So let's go ahead and rewrite that as F required must equal the force of friction plus this component of gravity um, and so there we have it there's that final equation now we just need to plug things in well we know that the force of friction friction is going to equal to um, our force of friction is going to equal to our uh, normal force times our mu. Well, in this case, our normal force is Fy. You see that? Fy is going normal to that surface. So we are going to then rewrite this as Fy times mu, which if we use trigonometry and we know what Fy is equal to, Fy is going to equal to the cosine this time, right? So we can write this as the force of gravity times um, cosine theta, okay? So now we can go ahead and put this into maybe a final step, but what we're going to do first is we're going to say the force of gravity is equal to um, mass times gravity, which 
if we're going to do this in English units is going to equal to weight. So let's go ahead and substitute everything in and get a final equation. So final equation is F required is going to equal to our force of friction, which we found to be weight times the cosine of theta and plus fx, which we found to be weight times sine of theta. And uh, I'm missing the mu component of friction. So we're gonna go ahead and write that in as well. And we're gonna go ahead and move this over and go ahead and write it in here as well. So this is the force required in order to go up a hill. So this is extremely important because from here, we can now determine what our torque required is. Well, our torque required, we're gonna go ahead and shorten that torque rec, is going to equal our force required times a distance in which it's acting. And in this case, the torque is coming from uh, this wheel, so we must know the diameter of this wheel or the radius of it. So we can either write it as torque is equal to force times the radius, or we can write it as force times uh, d divided by 2. In this case, I'm going to write it as uh, the diameter divided by 2. Okay, so that's our torque required. Moving along, we know that is the torque required. Now, if we want to, let's say, have motors on um, more than one wheel, we just divide this torque by the number of motors that we're going to have. So if we wanted to do that, we could say that the torque required for each motor is going to equal to the force required times your D over 2 is going to be divided by the number of motors. Okay, so we are almost at the final stage and the last thing to do is to understand that we are going to be, ha be having um, efficiencies. Um, so what we can do pretty much at this point is um, write down our efficiency. And the reason we do what is the efficiency of the system is because we have losses in our system. So no system is completely perfect, right? So in the motor, you're gonna have um, inefficiencies. In your um, battery, you're gonna have inefficiencies. So all of those kinds of things. So we're gonna add that into the equation as well. So we're gonna say that torque required is really going to equal um, calculating in now our efficiency is 100 divided by this efficiency. And we are going to do the F required, force required Diameter of that wheel divided by two over the number of motors that we will have, okay? So moving along, now that we know the torque we need to get from this motor, let's calculate some more things that we're gonna need from this motor. So since we know torque, we know the power of this motor needs to be the torque times the angular velocity that's what that w is that is angular velocity and then from that we can say that well we know the power is equal to the current times the voltage we can select what voltage we want so we are going to solve for current so current is just going to equal to our power divided by the voltage that we choose and from there um, 
we can find something else um, really important. Um, so let me go ahead and just write this down because this is the um, same relationship right here. And then this most important part of selecting the battery is going to be the capacity of the battery pack. And the capacity is given by our C. And that's going to equal to our current times time. And time being the operational hours that we want. So now we can figure out these things. So our solutions, in our solutions, we can figure out one, our capacity, which is extremely important. We can figure out the power, which is also very important. And um, those are the two main things that we need to now go ahead and select our motor. So to reiterate and kind of scrolling back up, we start off with a simple problem. And we say we need to go up a hill, force required. Well, what's dragging us down the hill? Friction and gravity. Using those that just that start, we developed all these equations to figure out how much power we're going to need from our motor and what our capacity will be. Now, if you guys have any questions on these calculations, just go ahead and leave a comment in this section down below and I'll get to you. And um, let's go ahead and move on to the next step in this next portion.